Um, <clears throat> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. نويت التعلم والتعليم والتذكر والتذكير والنفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة ولحث على التمسك بكتاب الله وبسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والدعاء على الهداء والدلالة على الخير ابتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى اللهم بارك لنا في رجب وشعبان وبلغنا رمضان اللهم بارك لنا في رجب وشعبان وبلغنا رمضان اللهم بارك لنا في رجب وشعبان وبلغنا رمضان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله نستعد إن شاء الله تعالى بسم الله uh, before we start, um, Nasreen, you had some questions from last class which I uh, couldn't uh, take. Apologies. Assalamu alaikum, Ustaz. Wa alaikum assalam. Yes, please, go ahead. So, um, it was not from the last session, it's I think from the one before that. It's all good, it's all good, go ahead. So, it was the lesson that you talked about um, being in fear of the wrath of Allah. Okay. So, I, I like, is that how we should live? Because I, I thought that was quite scary way of living. And so, can you just explain that a bit more? Because I thought that we, we live in the hope of Jannah. Is but you said that it's not guaranteed. Does that not make us feel a bit sad, or should it not? It should not make. It should not. It should not necessarily make us feel sad because that is the reality, isn't it? That Jannah is not guaranteed for anyone. But but that, isn't that what everyone aims for from a young age? That's what you learn. No, you, you uh, no, you. But we we also don't learn to be in fear of Allah, do we? We rely on Allah's mercy. Okay, okay, good. Just like love for Um so firstly, um how how to put this? Okay, let's start with um we live in the hope of Jannah. Um true, but at the same time realize nothing we are going to do will make us deserving of Jannah. Yeah, so the first thing to realize is there's nothing that we can do that will make us deserving of Jannah. Yeah, there's uh, um, <laughs> um, so uh, our, act um, our actions always fall short. Our actions always fall short. Um, and um, even then, so so the, be the beauty of it all is, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who guides us in the first place. Alhamdulillah, الذي هدانا لهذا. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one who guided us to uh, to the truth. And if not for him, we would have never been guided. So it's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anyway. So our guidance is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, <clears throat> and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from his mercy, he guides us. And he decrees for us deeds, which which um which are um which are good inshallah ta'ala and despite his these shortcomings he accepts them from us having decreed them for us he accepts them from us and he pardons our shortcomings and he takes us to jannah inshallah ta'ala it's all from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if there is anything from us it's shortcoming it's, if there's anything from us it's shortcoming and <clears throat> this shortcoming if Allah wills, He can take us to task for it. No doubt. If Allah wills, He can take us to task for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can take us to task for it. The best, the, the scholars, they say that the religion is like, your religion is like a bird with two wings. Your religion is like a bird with two wings. <clears throat> you need to have hope and fear. 
you need to have hope and fear. Umar radiallahu anhu, he was asked, uh, he, he said, if amongst thousand people, if amongst thousand people, there was only one person from them decreed for Jannah, I would have hope that I'm that person. And if there was amongst those thousand people, there was only one who was decreed for the hellfire and the rest for Jannah, I would fear that I'm, I'm that person. How, how you must, you, you must hold hope and fear both. You must, to the extent that your hope does not make you complacent and your, and your fear does not lead you to despair. You should have both. Does that make sense? Your hope, if you have, if you rely on hope, and this is the problem, we we are taught about hope, about hope all the time. Without fear, what does hope result in? Complacency, and that's how we see ourselves living our lives. It's like, oh Allah subhanahu wa taala will forgive us. Like Imam Ali says, "Kalimatul Haq, like in Yuradu bihal Baatil." It's a statement of truth. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa taala can forgive anything and everything He desire, anything He wishes. But at the same time, he can also he can also chastise us for 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 that. Yeah. So the religion has two. Yeah. There is hope and there is fear. And they say for the duration of your life, better to have more fear than hope. Better to have more fear than hope because that fear, and the fear is not necessarily is not necessarily of punishment. The fear is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is, is displeased with us. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with us. That is, there is no worse punishment. There's no worse punishment than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being displeased with the slave. Like, yes, the hellfire is there. But for the lover, for the person who claims love, this is the worst punishment. The, not the fact that he's being punished. But the fact that he has displeased his Lord. So the fear is not necessarily of the punishment, but the fear is of the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same, so they said you for the duration of your life, you should have more fear than hope. But as you approach when when you can see your end, when you, if, if, if your end is such that you can see your end, at that point, khalas, it's all hope. Yeah, there's no now there is no room for fear. You should meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should be ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Doesn't matter whatever has been, whatever has been doesn't matter. You should you should meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the yaqeen that He is the most merciful, that He will forgive everything. Yeah, because the Prophet said, Ana inda wani abdi bi. bi Yeah, I am in the opinion of my slave, so he, so let him think of me what he wishes. And the Prophet ﷺ also said, the one man Allah, ahab Allahu The one who loves to meet Allah subhanahu wa taala, Allah subhanahu wa taala loves to meet him. See, there will never be a point, even even the people like like for example, we give the greatest people have ever been. Yeah, none of them were, were died saying, oh, I'm so confident that I'm going to go into Jannah. Yeah, I'm going. It's like, no, they're just happy to meet Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. They don't want any guarantees. It's just that they're going back to their Lord. Khalas. That's that's all they want. <laughs> they're under no delusions. Oh, I have got Jannah guaranteed for me. No, they're just going back to their Lord. That's all. So between hope and fear, yeah. So we should have hope, but. As we live our lives, better to have a b more fear because it and fear not necessarily of punishment, but of the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can still choose to forgive you, but he may still, you may still have done things which have caused him displeasure. That drives a person to piety. That drives a person to piety. It's not necessarily the punishment. But the fact that he or she is displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah. So for the duration of your life, better to have more fear than hope. But if the end is near and it's clear, then khalas, there's no room for fear now. It's all hope. 
Yeah, so so they say when a person comes into religion, yeah, or they start on their path, they've come in like they're new to kind of they're, they're rediscovering their faith or they're new to the religion. It's all hope. It's all hope. Because what do you want? You don't want their connection with their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be a connection based on fear. You want the connection to be based on love. And then once that love is established, now they must be made to realize they must have a sense, a fear of losing that love. Not necessarily fear of punishment, a fear of losing that love. And that should drive them to maintain that and maintain that throughout the duration of their lives such that when they are khalas, they're now ready to meet their Lord, it's all hope. Yeah, it's all hope. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So when you so so it's not it's not necessarily that oh Allah SWT is going to punish me. No. I don't want to do things to upset Allah SWT. That's that's the goal. Yeah. It's it's not um and um, unfortunately this is where we fall short because we have a very twisted understanding in the sense that oh he's going to forgive everything, so don't worry about anything. Oh Allah will forgive everything. Uh, no, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is close to those people who do good. <coughs> Anything else? Was that all? No, um, um, the other thing was, there was um, in that um, class you mentioned about a sheikh mm. who it, he, he had a dream mm. and in that um, he was it that he feared or he saw the wrath of Allah? What what does that mean? What did it, what does the dream mean? He just it's just, just um, that he saw that he was from the people who deserved punishment. That it was written, it it was written that he was from the people who deserved ch chastisement. And that's the case for all of us, like ev everyone other than the prophets. We are all we all fall short. Yeah. So uh, that's what he saw. Um, but obviously, all of, all of us fall into that category. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives whoever he chooses to forgive. Yeah? Yes. Okay, okay. Uh, anyone else? Any questions before we carry on? Okay. Bismillah. Muhammad, do you want to read or is there uh, fireworks in the background? Um, if if you do hear some uh, noise, it's not me, by the way, it's my neighbour. I'll, I'll just say, um, I, I haven't, uh, anyway, uh, bismillah. Um, oh disciple, it is desirable for you that your speech and action be in accord with the law since knowledge and action which are not modelled on the law are error. And you must not be deceived by the ecstatic expressions and outbursts of the Sufis, since travel on this path should be by way of self-exertion, se severing the ego's appetite and killing its passions with the sword of discipline, and not by way of outbursts and useless statements. Know that the unrestrained tongue and the heart that is rusted over and full of negligence and greed are a sign of misfortune. And if you do not kill the ego with sincere exertion, your heart will not be animated by the lights of gnosis. Know that the answers to some of the things about which you have about which you asked me are not brought about through writing and discussion. If you attain to that state, you will know that they are. And if not, knowing them is an impossibility in that they pertain to direct experience. The description of anything to do with direct experience is not furnished through discussion, as the sweetness of what is sweet and the bitterness of what is bitter is not known except by taste. Thus, it was related that an impotent man wrote to a friend of his to tell him what the pleasure of sex was like. 
He wrote back to him in reply, Oh, so and so, I thought you were just impotent. Now I know that you are impotent and stupid, since this pleasure is to do with direct experience. If you attain it, you know it. Otherwise, the description of it is not furnished through talking and writing. This is a global poem. Um, so again, as Imam Al Ghazali begins, uh, the translation is desirable, but in reality, Ambari here means it's it it must it it should be that your speech and action be in accordance with the law. The law meaning the fiqh, yeah, law meaning that which is um, allowed and that which is prohibited, yeah, that which is obligatory. So knowledge of fiqh is essential. Knowledge of fiqh is essential to the extent of your circumstances, yeah. If so, obviously every sane adult Muslim needs to pray. Yeah, so you need to know the rules of purity. Yeah, um, and uh, you need to know the rules of prayer. You need to know the law, uh, the rules of prayer, fasting, Ramadan, zakat for those who have wealth. And if you are about to go on Hajj, then you need to know the rules about Hajj. If you are getting married or you are married, then you need to know the rules of marriage and divorce. Because there are things a man can say which can end the marriage. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the word of divorce. It can be there, there are things. So and so you need to know. So you need to know. And if you are in business, you need to the, know the rule, the laws of transaction. What's allowed and what's not. So knowledge of the law is essential with regards uh, to the extent of your circumstances. And there is no uh, there's no excuse in that regard. Yeah, the only and the only cure for ignorance is knowledge. There is no other cure. Yeah, if you don't know something like the, the only the only solution is to learn like, oh, man, I can't. There's no like. <laughs> There's no cure. There's no other like alternative. Like if you don't have wudu, you can do tayammum. Yeah. If you can't do wudu uh, under certain conditions, again you need to know the law. Yeah. You need to know fiqh. You can do tayammum. Yeah. Tayammum is allowed for you. But if you don't know something, the only solution is to know know what needs to be done. The only the only solution, the only cure to ignorance is in knowledge. Yeah. <clears throat> So knowledge of that which you need is essential. So the um, the problem uh, the problem which we have is many a times we don't know what needs to be done. We don't know what needs to be done in a given situation, and many a times people are busy learning things which they don't need. So that's the first one. Your knowledge and action which are not modeled on the law, the Sharia, the Sharia of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they are in error. Yeah, if you did something without knowing whether it was right or wrong, even if it were right, you are still sinful for your ignorance. Yeah. Say, for example, I didn't know if Maghrib was three rakahs or four rakahs. <laughs> I took a guess and I prayed three. <laughs> I'm still sinful for my ignorance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like a simple example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so even if you get it right, you're still in error, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like that's what they say the, the, the Mufassir of the Quran. So no one should do Tafsir of the Quran unless they have the necessary credentials, which <laughs> which very few people do. Um, so even if, like, even if you, if, if someone else tried to explain the Quran, e and they try to explain it from themselves, even if they are correct, they did something which is not allowed. Even if they were to be correct in what they said, it's not. It's 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 not allowed for them to do such a thing. Yeah. So knowledge is essential. Knowledge is essential and you take it from people of knowledge. Yeah. And the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون فاسألوا أهل الذكر إن كنتم لا تعلمون If you do not know, ask the people of knowledge Ask the people of knowledge That's all Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says That's the, that's the most obvious thing yeah? If you don't know something then you need to ask people who do So that you now know yeah? um, And um, So he stresses the importance of fiqh Because without fiqh what happens? <laughs> Imam Ghazali explains next. Yeah? <laughs> then you get the goofy Sufis. <laughs> yeah? Um, so, yeah, do, and then he goes on to say, yeah, do, don't be taken by all these things which people do. Don't be taken by all these things which people do in the name of Sufism. Yeah? What is Sufism? He says, this is by the way of self-exertion. It's by exerting yourself, pushing yourself, pushing yourself to purify yourself. To purify yourself, more importantly, purify your heart. Purify your heart. It's, <clears throat> that's the first. That's the first requirement. Yeah. And how does that take place? By, se by severing the ego, the ego's appetite. There is and killing its passions, even though the word here used here is killing. The religion does not necessarily quote unquote literally require you to kill your passions. Whereas there is no room whatsoever in the religion for the ego. Yeah, because for every passion, every desire that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed within the human being, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a halal avenue for the human being to indulge in that desire. There is no desire in the human being that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala placed except that he gave a halal avenue for the human being to indulge in that pleasure in a manner which is legal, lawful, and pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, like a like um, he said to the compa uh, one of the companions of the Allah uh, that when when he uh, when he had marital intimacy with his spouse his wife that was an act of sadaqa that was an act of charity and and the companion he asked what do you mean by act of charity uh, we, I just fulfill my desire like I just <laughs> I just uh, fulfill my desire. Do you not see that you could have desire, fulfilled your desire in a manner which was unlawful and in which case you would have been punished for that or you would have been, you you could have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could take you to task for that if you did it in an unlawful manner and that you have done it lawfully, does that now not mean that you will be rewarded for what you have done? So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not place within the human being a desire except that he made a halal avenue for it to be fulfilled. <clears throat> but at the same time, the nafs, the lower self, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires us to subjugate it. Yeah, there is no room for arrogance in the religion. There is no room for vanity. Yeah, there is no room for showing off. Yeah, there, there is no room for all of these. Yeah. So, this is Sufism, exerting ourselves. Exerting ourselves with regards to first and foremost, knowing what is legal and what's not. First, you need to know what is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires of us. And then you can exert yourself. Many a times people exert themselves in things which are like, <laughs> Allah alam, like what are you exerting yourself for? Yeah? Yeah, I'm on this strict diet for such and such days. And they're like killing themselves. <laughs> it's, and you're like, do you expect some kind of, what are you expecting that you that what do you expect of this with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? <laughs> yeah, if you're generally okay, if you're generally not unhealthy, what are you expecting out of this quote unquote exertion? Yeah, 
So with the sword of discipline, yeah, the point being you have to be military, yeah. If you fall short, then you should have way, you should have a mechanism to pick yourself back up because many a time people fall on their first hurdle, yeah. So you should be disciplined at the same time. Acknowledge that you're a human being. Yeah. It is inconceivable that a human being, it's not, it's, it's possible though, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give that to a person. And no doubt there are persons as such, but normal human beings, you will fall, you will fall, and you have to pick yourself back up. Yeah. So you, you need to, you need to be um, cognizant of the fact that you're a human being, first of all and foremost. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in weakness, that we have been created weak. And not in the way of outbursts and useless statements. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So talking about things which are of no consequence. And he carries on the unrestrained tongue and the heart that is rusted over and full of negligence and greed. What did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said? He just said this. <clears throat> The one who protects, for, the one who safeguards for me, that which is between his two jaws and that which is between his two thighs, I will guarantee for them Jannah. The ones who guarantee that which is between their two jaws, i.e. their tongue, and that which is between their two thighs, I guarantee for them Jannah. And they say, like, <laughs> the tongue, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put it on, is, is, he's, Double locked it, so there's your there's your teeth to stop your tongue, and then your lips. Of all your other senses, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has put placed a double lock. Why? For us to hold our tongues. Yeah. There are few. There are few troubles. There are few problems which have arisen, except that it was through the tongue. Except that it was through the tongue. Abu Bakr radiallahu used to place pebbles in his mouth just to force his tongue to stop. Not that he needed to discipline himself. So that if he needed to speak, he had to take the pebbles out in order to speak. Yeah? So it would force him to think, do I really need to speak now? Do I really need to speak? <laughs> yeah? So... Yeah, silence. Silence is one of the most one of the beautiful gifts of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. If you cannot benefit from a person's silence, just being with them in silence, if you cannot benefit from them, their company in their silence, you cannot really benefit from them when they speak. It doesn't matter what they speak. Those are the people of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. You just benefit from their silence. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself, he used to barely speak. He would barely speak. And if he spoke, they could count, the companions of the Allah, they could count what is words in their hands. He would speak briefly. He wouldn't sit down and lecture people as a norm. He wouldn't do that. <clears throat> Why? Not because that he didn't have anything to say. Because he wanted to make things easy for people, no doubt. Yeah. Because the more he says, the more we have to live by. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, do not ask, do not ask that which you have not been told of. Yeah. The people who went before you, they did that. <laughs> and it destroyed them. It destroyed them. Yeah. Asking unnecessary things. Yeah. Things which have not been necessarily specified. If you want to specify that which has been unspecified, you're making life difficult for yourself. <coughs> the clear example is the cow, yeah? Surah Baqarah, the cow, or the, um, the Banu Israel did. Um, and the heart that is rusted over, this again is the Quranic parable, Kalla bal rana ala qulubihim ma kanu yaksibun. Ran, is rust. 
their hearts have been rusted over because of what they used to do. Yeah. That oh, I'm. That that our actions, that our actions have an effect on our hearts, no doubt. Our actions have an effect on our heart, i.e. on our faith in and of itself, because the heart is the locus of your faith, is rusted over and full of negligence. Negligence, which is heedlessness. Heedlessness, negligent of that which requires attention. Yeah, that which requires our attention. And full of greed, i.e. it's overcome by your lower self, our lower egos. We just want to carry on feeding our desires, which is where greed comes in. This is a sign of misfortune. This is a sign of misfortune, no doubt with dunya in this world. And if it's not rectified, it is feared that it's a sign of misfortune in Akhira as well. And if you do not kill the ego with sincere exertion of your your heart, your, your heart will not be animated by the lights of gnosis. That faith is a light. And the knowledge, the knowledge which Allah SWT revealed, revelation is a light. Imam Shafi'i, rahmahullah ta'ala, he goes to his teacher, Waqiyya, he goes to his teacher, Waki, and Imam Shafi, he is one of the, he was, ex, he was known for his exceptional memory. He was known for his exceptional memory. Yeah, it is said that he could read a book. <laughs> if he had the book in front of him, he could read both the pages at the same time. <laughs> yeah, and um, he, it, he, it is said he went to his teacher, Waki, rahimahullah ta'ala, and he said, um, and, and he compiled a poem with regards to what happened. Shakautu ila waqi'in su'a hifdi fadallani ila tarki al-ma'asi qala li inna al-ilma nurun wa nurullahi la yuhda li la'asi I went to waqi'a shakautu ila waqi'i su'a hifdi I complained to waqi'a about my weakness in memorization fadallani ila tarki al-ma'asi and he told me, he told, and he advised me to leave sinning, to stop sinning. And he told me that knowledge is a light. And the light of God is not given to a sinner. So we should, so that, is how you, that, and, and Imam Malik, he said this, like the <clears throat> knowledge, uh, like knowledge is not by having multiple narrations. You know a lot of stuff, yeah? It's, it's a, uh, I know this book, I know that book, I know this, that. No, but knowledge, uh, is the light which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places in the heart of the believer. And Imam Malik, He's, he's a muhaddith. He's one of the earliest muhaddith, like the accomplished hadith scholar. He's saying, and, and a faqih at the same time, person of deep understanding of the religion, mujtahid imam. What is he saying? Knowledge is not in that. Knowledge is that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places in the heart of the believer. That which the shining light, which is, is, is um, the light which cannot be put out. Yeah, it's a light which cannot be put out. That is true knowledge. Because there's many a person who would study so many things, like a person who can study aqidah, books after books with the best of scholars. And at the same time in his life, he's just the smallest thing upsets him. He's like, oh, what happens now? Oh, he's just flustered by the smallest thing which happens in his life. And you're like, well, what have you really learned in Aqeedah in, with regards to your belief, with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that everything is under his control. Nothing happens except through him. Where is the reality of that which you have studied? That How has that really penetrated your heart? Yeah, so knowledge is that which takes firm root in the heart. 
Yeah, so this is the essence of knowledge. This is why we seek knowledge. Every knowledge has a reason why we seek it. And that ultimately connects to the light. The light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being placed in your heart. Light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense knowledge. Knowledge. Experiential knowledge being placed inside the heart of the believer. And then he goes on to talk about things which again Sufis love to talk about. Yeah. He says the, some of these things you have asked me about. There's no point talking about them. Yeah. It's either you know them through experience or you don't. Yeah. Either you know them through experience or you don't. And at the same time, he does not at any point also say that you should seek out these experiences, which again, something which people are obsessed with. Yeah, like um, Imam Haddad in his book, uh, Adab Saluk al Murid, um, um, he clearly ex he says, like, it's disapproved for a person to seek out these experiences and visions and whatnot. It's disapproved. You shouldn't. You shouldn't want those. If Allah subhanahu wa taala gives them to you, that's a different issue. And again, the people of Allah subhanahu wa taala, how do they look at this? This is like a test for me now. Yeah, it's not like oh, mashallah, I'm on it, you know. <laughs> no, it's like Allah subhanahu wa taala is testing me with this. I need to stay firm. I need to carry on. Yeah. But but people, unfortunately, all are like. A lot of our exertion is for spiritual experiences. Yeah. It's like I'm driving to London, but I'm not really driving to London. I'm going, I'm going because on the way there's this, you know, there's in the services there, they make those really good, whatever it is. <laughs> you know, your, your destination is somewhere else. Yeah. If it comes along the way, it comes along the way. And if you take it, you take it. Yeah. But that's not your destination. That's not your objective. Yeah. And you shouldn't necessarily seek them. And if you have them, you shouldn't talk about them. Why? Because firstly, if you talk about them, firstly, it's showing off. It's showing off. Yeah. Is showing off, which again is a problem in and of itself. Even if it is not that, the person you're speaking to, either he's going to be a skeptic, in which case you're going to increase that person in his skepticism, or that person is a person who, even if he's, um, um, uh, he acknowledges what is being told to him, it's not going to make any sense to him whatsoever because he's a person who has not experienced the same. Yeah, like can you ex like the example here, marital intimacy? The pleasure of marital intimacy cannot be explained. Ex uh, the same way, any 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 experience cannot be explained to anyone else. Like, can you explain that how a rose smells to a person who hasn't smelled a rose? So you can't. Yeah. So there is no benefit that comes back to the point. Yeah, useless statements. Yeah. No point talking about these things. No point talking about these things. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions or comments? I've one of, um, just got, just got uh, two uh, small two comments. comments. Um, yeah. Very powerful, but you, we started off with the fact the whole thing. Um, you mentioned something which it just struck a chord with me um, just now. You, you said that every pleasure or desire that Allah has created um, is um, allowed a halal avenue for us. And when you were saying this, um, it's just made me think that one of the trickeries, this is for me, by the way, I might be wrong here. One of the trickeries of the shaitan is makes us think that if we are religious, if we are on the right path, then yeah. we'll be missing out on the worldly pleasures. Whereas from what you've just said, it's clear that all these pleasures, they can be found on the right path. Um, they may be more concealed. Uh, they may not be as easy as on the wrong path, but yet they are. Um, 
um, av available or attainable to us. And um, one of the examples I thought about was um, like, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that the um, coolness of, of his eyes is in prayer. Yeah. And um, it's something which, you know, if you rushed in your prayer, you're never going to experience this. Yeah. And if you you pray um, with the required, you know, you, you you try, you aim to pray with the required um, intentions and um, calmness, yeah. you yeah. may you may attain it. Yeah, um, after ten or twenty years, yeah. Even probably more. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, and and related to this, you, you you mentioned the second bit, which is some of these experiences. Some of them you can attain it. Some of them you can't. And one of, when you were saying this, something just popped into my mind. I was thinking, you know, the the common statement that um, um, we we live to eat and we eat to live. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and 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 to me, I was thinking, you know. Very often, if we overindulge or um, or do a, um, one particular action excessively, this is where we go wrong, and we do too oh, well. When I say we, it's, I do too many of them. Yeah, that's that, that. Even even physiologically, your dopamine yeah. stops starts decreasing rapidly, doesn't it? Once you start yeah. overindulging in something, and you just need to like keep doing it so much, even to get even a small fraction of what you got the first time, isn't it? Absolutely, tolerance. Yeah. yeah. It's even, even that's physiologically, even sociologically, like they say, like the, the law of diminishing returns, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. The first plate of food is mashallah good. The second plate, mm. Mm. <laughs> go third. <laughs> it's like, what's the point? <laughs> Yeah, uh, but the other thing is the point you mentioned with regards to the halal is like you have a halal avenue for everything. But the problem is many a times the way we we have um, our society is structured and the societal norms. Many a times we make the halal very difficult and the haram very easy. Yes. Yeah, the way society is. We have made halal. I'm talking about Muslim societies, Muslim cultures, Muslim, and even those in the like, especially those in the UK, which is more relevant to us. We have made halal so difficult and haram so easy. Yeah, and now this, this is a problem now. Yeah, in 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 an in a in in a healthy Muslim community, halal should be the easiest thing. Haram should be like difficult. Mm. <laughs> like you should like <laughs> you should have you should go that like <laughs> it should be really difficult like to fall into haram because the halal is so easy. Like an easy example now is like marriage, marriage in our communities. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Just to get married. <laughs> what does a person need to do? <laughs> Religiously speaking, according to the law, it's very easy. <laughs> Nothing the person needs to do. Yeah, you just need you just need two witnesses and khalas, you're done. Go go on, khalas, <laughs> you're sorted. But what is the norm? The cultural norm, and even the halal <laughs> is done in such a haram. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's not let's let's not talk about marriages. Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah. We need to do something about the book. You know, we need to move on. Uh, any other questions or comments? Any other questions or comments? Yeah. So don't. So the key point is like, don't worry about experiences. And see, many times a vision might be a person given a vision might be tested with that vision and perhaps a person is not given a vision and that's better for that person because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that person better. Yeah, so having a vision or not having a vision is not necessarily is not necessarily a sign of anything is not necessarily a sign of anything unless that vision is interpreted by someone who knows how to interpret visions in a manner saying, Khalas, this is inshallah good. This is not, yeah? 
But yeah, so just carry on. See, you can only do what you can do. And we are constantly falling short in what we are doing. So no point worrying about these things. Yeah, that's what Imam Ghazali is saying. Let's take it from a Sufi, a real Sufi. Yeah. O oh, disciple, some of your questions are of this sort. And as for those capable of being answered, we have mentioned them in the revival of the sciences and other works. We mention here excerpts from it while referring you to it. We say the spiritual traveller needs four things. The first thing is an authentic creed which contains no innovation. The second is true contrition, after which there is no going back to reoffending. The third is reconciliation with enemies, so that none of them retains a claim against you. The fourth is obtaining enough knowledge of the Sharia for the commands of God the Exalted to be executed. Then, whatever of the other sciences through which there is salvation. It is related that Shibli, may God be merciful to him, served 400 masters and he said, I studied 4,000 traditions, then I chose a single tradition out of them and acted in accordance with it, giving up the rest, for I mediated for, and for I meditated on it and I found my deliverance and salvation in it. The knowledge of the ancients and the moderns being all included in it, I contended myself with it. And it is that the messenger of God, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, said to one of his companions, work for your terrestrial life in proportion to your stay in it and work for your afterlife in proportion to your eternity in it. Work for God in proportion to your need for him and work for the fire in proportion to your ability to endure it. Yeah, so. So he carries on Imam Al-Ghazali rahimahullah ta'ala with regards to um, answering questions of a spiritual nature. Yeah, so he says, so of those questions of those sort, yeah, those which can be answered in a manner which benefits, in a manner which is beneficial, he's answered them in Ihya al din And to summarize, what, what, and, and that which benefits, he is summarizing it here, which he's saying is it's not really nothing to do, it's not necessarily to quote unquote of a spiritual nature, but it's very practical nature, yeah. Yeah, Spirit, that spirituality that does not have any practical implication is not spirituality. La talking about things in the air is not spirituality. Oh, about this, about that, doesn't matter. If it doesn't, if there is not something which is you, you can do something about, there's no point in talking about it. Yeah, like the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, Imam Ghaza, Imam al Nawi, rahimahullah taala, places it in one of the forty foundational hadith of this religion. من حسن إسلام مرئي تركه ما لا يعنيه. From the beauty of one's Islam, من حسن إسلام مرئي. From the beauty of one's Islam, تركه ما لا يعنيه. Leaving that which does not concern him. Yeah. So if there is no benefit, if talking about things which are of no relevance to you, what's the point? Yeah. What's the point? Yeah, like we said, we should restrain restrain our tongues from that which does not concern us. Yeah, <clears throat> we say. Um, so he says the four things which uh, salik or a spiritual wayfarer needs. The first one is, and the spiritual the salik the spiritual traveler is in reality. What does that mean? Muslim. Yeah, or if you went broader, the human being. Yeah. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being. What does this human being now need to do in order to attain salvation? The first thing is um, authentic creed which contains no innovation. Yeah. 
this is the first the first requirement for any human being is to first acknowledge is to first acknowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believe in that which he has sent believe in that which he has sent yeah and and to do that in a manner in the manner which he subhanahu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intended yeah in i.e without any innovation without any innovation this is the first requirement yeah so you'll find that ahlu sunnah yeah the um, ahlu sunnah which is generally referred to um, um like what we would call as orthodox islam like mainstream sunni islam is a is in belief it's either ash'ari or maturidi or to a certain degree the atharis to a certain degree the atharis so you so these are the acceptable schools of belief. These are the acceptable ways of formulating one's creed, of one's belief. Um, and you should you should know this. You should know what you believe in about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should know what you believe about the prophets, alayhi wasalam. You should know what you believe about the angels, the the books which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about the day of judgment, about um, predestination uh, and free will. And you need to know what you believe about all these things. Yeah, and why you believe in them. Why you believe in them. Because belief is to do with conviction and you cannot, you can never have conviction because, oh, I believe because such and such person told me that this is correct. No. That, that cannot be. How can you have conviction in that? Oh, I believe because he said such and such. What do you know about such and such person? Like, yeah, you, your belief, you are personally accountable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. So you need to know why you believe what you believe. Yeah. <clears throat> and the second is, what does he say? This true contrition, i.e. tawbah. Tawbah, after which there is no going back to reoffending. This, there is a, there is an aspect of this, which is in, quote unquote, our hands, and there is an aspect of which, it which is not. The aspect of it which is in our hands is, every time a person slips, that they repent and turn back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and they continue doing this. Either until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the person back to him or until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees the person of that shortcoming. That is all a person can do. As long as he's doing that, that's all is required of the person. Yeah? Like um, the teacher of our teachers, say Sheikh Sayyid Ramadan al Muti, he would repeatedly stress this in his classes. He would repeatedly stress this in our classes. A person who slips out of his weakness, out of his weakness, and he repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely every time he slips, turns back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he begs for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, and he says, uh, I'm, I'm, and he acknowledges his weakness in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, saying, I've slipped again and I'm I'm weak, I'm, I, and I, I am regretful. I'm regretful over what I've done, and I will. And you sincerely try to re, uh, remove that shortcoming from yourself. How is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala not going to forgive this person? How is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala not going to forgive this person? Yeah, this ties into the question which Nasreen asked. This is where. You should one should hope for mercy. But if a person is persistent, is, is doing the same same, like this person, even though the person is repenting, and Hassan al Basri, um Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he was asked, What do you say of a person who sins 70 times in a day? 70 is like a big number. Yeah, 70 means like a huge number, like yeah, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Yeah, okay. Yeah, so he says. He sins 70 times in a day and he repents every time he sins. Yeah. 
And you know what Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala said? That is the sign of a believer. That is the sign of a mu'min. Yeah. Firstly, don't make excuses. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. Oh, it's... No, firstly, don't make excuses. Firstly, and and have remorse. Every time we slip up, we should have remorse. And we should have a firm resolve not to go back to it. And you should turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seeking forgiveness. Every time. Every time. Yeah. So this is all which is there in our hands. And it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there will, and no doubt there will come a time. How, how is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees the slave repenting, 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 says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not free the slave of that shortcoming? How is it possible? It will come. All that requires is patience. Requires is patience. Not patience in sinning, but patience in repenting. Yeah. yeah. Seek your assistance through patience and prayer. In Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with who? In Allah Sabirin with those who are patient. <coughs> yeah. And the third is reconciliation with enemies. With enemies, so that none of them retains a claim against you. Yeah, we find it difficult to reconcile with friends and family, let alone enemies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's no good, there's no good in, <sighs> see, there's no good in bearing grudges against anyone. Like, religiously speaking, you're not allowed to bear a grudge against anyone. Um, and you shouldn't let anyone have a valid reason to bear a grudge against you. Yeah? If you have intentionally or, inshallah, unintentionally harmed a person such that that person is now displeased, then it is upon us to now make it up to that person. It's required, like it's, like there's no going around it. It's required that we make up because that person has rights. It doesn't matter if that person is Muslim or not. Yeah? You know, Ghazal is saying reconciliation with enemies. Yeah? And we don't necessarily view non-Muslims as enemies anyway. But the point being, <coughs> um, you should... Da'wat al mustajab. The dua of the oppressed is answered doesn't matter if that person is Muslim or not, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates oppression. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hates oppression. So, and you should reconcile, because this is one of those things which will block people on the sirat as they're crossing the hellfire, is the wrongs which they have done to others, the wrongs which we do, to, between, which are between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can and inshallah will forgive as long as we seek repentance, inshallah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can and will forgive. But wrongs which we do to others, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive on the condition that those who have been wronged also forgive. These are one of those things which will block people on the sirat. Which will block people on the sirat. That you, the person cannot carry on until the wrong has been set right. The wrong has been set right. So, and many a times it's friends and family. It's friends and family who have been wronged. How many a family member is going to drag each other into the hellfire because they couldn't set things right in this dunya? They had to take it to the next world. They had to take it to the akhirah. Yeah, set things right. Set things right. It's not at all worth it. It's not at all worth it. You will not wish one second of hellfire on your worst enemy if you had any ounce of humanity. It's not at all worth it. Set things right. 
<clears throat> yeah, and the fourth, the fourth is obtaining enough knowledge of the Sharia ah for the commands of God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be executed. Uh, the, the point we mentioned, you need to know enough of fiqh as it relates to your circumstance. Yeah, that which is present in your life, the things that you do in your life, which are specific to you, you need to have enough knowledge such that you are able to carry out those things in a manner which is lawful and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's lawful, then it's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, and whatever of the other sciences through which that there is salvation, anything that you need to attain salvation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to attain his pleasure. Yeah, and then it is related that Shibli, Shibli, rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the saints uh, of this religion, he said he served 400 masters, 400 masters. Yeah. And he said, I studied 4,000 traditions and I chose a single tradition out of them and acted in accordance with it, giving up the rest. Yeah. For I meditated on it and found my deliverance and salvation in it. What does this mean? He, he served 400 masters. He served 400 masters and studied 4,000 traditions from which he took one. I.e. it was not about the number. He was looking for that which he needed. Once he found that which he needed, khalas. I don't need anything else now. Yeah, the firstly, the seeker needs to know what he's seeking. Yeah, you can't be a seeker without knowing what you're seeking. It's like you're in a you're in a dark room. What are you seeking? You don't know what you're seeking. Anything that you can grab. No, it doesn't work like that. A seeker needs to know what he's seeking. And what are you seeking? You're seeking deliverance. You're seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the way, the way in which we attain deliverance, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is going to be unique for each one of us because each one of us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, created is unique. Yeah? Each one of us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, created us for a purpose. Each one of us have a purpose in life. And not all of us have the same quote-unquote outward purpose. Inwardly, yes, all of us have the same purpose to attain the pleasure of Allah. But the, how we attain that, it's not the same. It's rarely the same. Yeah? So what was Shibli looking for? He was looking for that which will help him attain his purpose. And then when he found it, he gave up the rest. Khalas, I'm, I'm, I'm fine now. I found what I was looking for. Yeah, what was that? The hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. What is it? I'mal li dunya ka bi qadri muqami ka fiha. Work for your afterlife, for your akhirah. In proportion, sorry, li amal li dunya ka. Work for your terrestrial life, for your life in this world, in proportion to your stay in it. Yeah, how long is your stay in it? You don't even know. Yeah, and and even the most generous estimate, a few years. <laughs> yeah, a few years, if that. Yeah, um, so work for your life in this world in proportion to your stay in it, and work for your akhira, your afterlife. وَعَمَلْ لِآخِرَتِكَ بِقَدْرِ بَقَائِكَ فِيهَا and work for your afterlife for the eternity that you're going to spend in it, in proportion to the eternity that you're going to spend in it. Yeah? So so say for example, say for example, um, say for example, um, I have to, I've been told I'm relocating for whatever reason, yeah? I have to go to say Japan, a language I don't know, for example. I don't know the language, I don't know Japanese. And I have to transit through China. Yeah, I have to transit through China. And I don't know Chinese as well. What would you say of a person who's trying to learn Chinese? I have to go and settle down in Jap Japan now. That's my foreseeable future. That's where I'm going to be. What will you say of a person who's trying to learn Chinese given a circumstance? Yeah? What will you say of a person who's trying to learn Chinese and he's not focused on Japanese? 
Let's say you're like, <laughs> you need to use something between your ears, isn't it then? Yeah. Like what? It's it's like like we like we are like in transit, yeah. We are in transit, and we want to make this transit as comfortable as possible. We want to build a house in the transit launch, <laughs> a comfortable house, and with all sorts of work, get a car or whatever it is. It's like <laughs> it doesn't relate to the reality which you quote unquote profess to believe. Yeah, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he came across a man who was building his house with adobe bricks, like they usually just had mud, like they used to build, like this was like, he was like building a, like a firm, like a good proper house. And the Prophet Sallallahu told him, like the affair is too dire for you to build such a house. Like you're not going to, it's like you don't know when your time is going to be up for you to build something which you want to last for, you know, quote unquote, a, a long, long time, yeah? And one of the principal hadiths, again from the 40 hadith of Imam Nawi, Kun fi dunya ka anna ka gharib aw abir is sabil. Like live in this world as though you are a stranger. It's like how will you be? How will you? So, so if I'm dropped into a place which is completely strange to me, I don't know their language, their cultures, their custom, nothing. I'm only going to like... What is my concern now? My concern is going to be, what do I do, need to survive? What is the basics, yeah? How do I need to get by, or get out of the situation? That's it, yeah? So work for this life in your proportion to your stay in it. And work for your after life in proportion to the eternity that you're going to spend in it. Because every action, every one of the our temporal actions have eternal consequences. Our temporal actions have eternal consequences. And work for God in your proportion to need for him, in your, your need for him. Yeah? I.e. work for the pleasure of God for in proportion to your need of his pleasure, which is everything. Yeah? Our need for his pleasure is absolute. Yeah? and work for the fire in proportion to your ability to endure it, and i.e. neglect working to um, distance yourself from the fire to the extent that you can bear the fire. Yeah, i.e. at your own peril. And you cannot bear it one iota. So what does Imam Shibli say? He left all the other traditions. Why? What does he mean? Uh, does that mean all those other traditions didn't have? No, he, he just, what does he mean? Everything from all the other traditions can be captured in this one hadith. Everything falls under this. Work for your work for your life in this world in your proportion to your stay in it. Yeah, do what you need. That's all. Yeah, and work for your akhirah to your extent to the eternity that you're going to spend there. I.e. <laughs> Nothing you're going to do is going to be enough. So better get busy. Yeah. Work for you. Work for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the pleasure for your need of his pleasure. I.e. which is absolute. And neglect working to distance yourself from the fire in proportion to your ability to bear it, which is we don't have any ability to bear it. So everything that he took from all his 400 masters and 4,000 traditions comes into this. It's like Imam Shafi reported to have said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, if all Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala had sent down was Surah Al-Asr, it would have sufficed us. What is Surah Al-Asr? Well, Asr, verily by time. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says that. Inna l-insana lafi khusr. Human being is in a state of loss. He's in utter loss. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Except for those who believe. وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ And do good works. وَتَوَاسَوْ بِالْحَقِّ And they counsel each other to the truth. وَتَوَاسَوْ sabr And they counsel each other to patience. This was enough. Because this cap captures everything. It, it encompasses everything. So his statement that he left everything else, no, no, he didn't leave, quote unquote. He said, oh, no, I'm not going to work. Everything comes under this. Bismillah. Any questions? Any comments?
Any questions or comments? No? Okay. I'll try to get one more page in inshallah. We don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, decide. Oh, decide. If you have knowledge of this tradition, there is no need for much learning. Meditate on some other quotations. Hatim al-Assam was one of the companions of Shaqiq al-Balqi. The mercy of God the exalted be upon them both. And one day he asked him and said, You have kept company with me for 30 years. What have you got out of them? He replied, I got eight useful lessons by way of knowledge, and they are enough and there are and they are enough of it for me. For I hope for my deliverance and salvation because of them. So Shaqiq said, What are they? Hatim al Assam replied, The first useful lesson is that I observed mankind and saw that everyone had an object of love and of infatuation, which he loved and with which he was infatuated. Some of what was loved accompanied him up to the sickness of death and some even up to the graveside. Then all went back and left him solitary and alone and not one of them entered his grave with him. So I pondered and I said, the best of what one loves is what will enter one's grave and be a friend to one in it. And I found it to be nothing but good deeds. So I took them as the object of my love to be a light for me in the grave, to be a friend to me in it and not leave me all alone. Yeah, we'll start. We'll we'll start. Pause there, inshallah. Yeah. I'll, I'll leave that for the next. Jazakallah. So, so Imam Al Ghazali is asking. So, if you know, if you know this hadith from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, this is sufficient as a guide for you in everything that you do in life. Everything that you do in life, measure it up in the light of this hadith. Yeah your life of this world, how much is that world? And how much is that worth? Your life of the next world, how much is that worth? Yeah, the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much is that worth? And your ability to withstand the hellfire, how much is that? Measure any action you do in the light of this hadith. And then the answer will be clear. Yeah, and it says there's no need for much learning. Yeah, yeah for, a per for a person of understanding, for a person of understanding, that's what they say. Um, the intelligent person, it's you don't even need to say something, just a small sign, and that person kind of understands. He gets what what the um, he gets the point. Yeah, for the discerning person, for the discerning person, you don't need to bombard that person. You don't need to bombard that person with and fact after fact or tradition after tradition, the, the discerning person, and it's not necessarily to be discerning with the mind, it's to be discerning with their heart. They have an open heart. Once that impacts, it's, khalas, it's done. Yeah, they don't need anything else now. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's what Imam al Ghazali is saying. It's not about I can keep on going, but you know, if you have this, then what, what more do you want? <laughs> yeah. And he goes on, if it's not enough, okay, fair, fair enough, yeah. We'll just carry on a bit, yeah. Um, so he says, Hatim al Asam was the companion of Shaqiq al Balkhi. And what does Shaqiq, Shaqiq say? You have kept me company for 30 years. What have you got out of them? First one, 30 years. That's what counts as company. Yeah, that's um, that's how um, you.
Assalamu alaikum. Apologies. Um, yeah, I don't know what triggers this, but sometimes I do get uh, kicked out. Maybe it's a sign. <laughs> uh, um, so the firstly, firstly, 30 years. So what benefits in reality is companionship of people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extended periods of time. Yeah. Extent of period of time. That's where you have the tarbiya. That's where you have the nurturing, the rearing of people. Yeah. Where, he, where a person um, now deals with the ailments which the person suffers from at the hands of the teacher who is competent at dealing with those situations, with those ailments. And it takes time. Yeah, because human beings are not robots. Human beings are not robots. You cannot just change the code and khalas, it now works the way you want it to work. It's not that many. So putting to practice that which you know takes time, takes effort, exertion, like we just mentioned. Yeah. So even though there is benefit, even in spending a moment with a person of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the real benefit, because even though there was benefit in that moment, it is possible that that moment can have a life changing effect, but many a times the person just goes back to living their life as it was in many instances, many, many a case. But real benefit is in having a companionship or an extended period of time with, with the person with the with the person of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, that's the first. The second one is the question. What have you got out of them? The companionship is not passive. It's active. Yeah, it's not like, oh, OK, I'm here. Yeah, OK, there's Barakah. No, you're, acti you're, you're actively seeking to benefit from that companionship. Yeah, you know why you're there. Yeah, you know why you're there. Yeah. The, the companionship of the Sahaba to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not passive, it was active. Yeah. They went to every, they, were, they did not spare any effort in recording even the most small, the most minute details with regards to their companionship with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and benefiting from him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like the kuffar, they used, they, they would try to mock the companions. Yeah, I, you, you're taking every, why does he have to tell you everything? Yeah, why do you have to listen to him in everything? Do, do you also need to learn how to relieve yourself from him? <laughs> and the companions of the Lanon there, reported that they replied, oh, we have done that already. <laughs> He's taught us that as well. <laughs> yeah. So companionship is why? It's because you seek to benefit. Oh, I'm here for the baraka. Khair, yeah, the baraka is in benefiting from them, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, you have one of those things, isn't it? I'm here for the baraka kind of thing, yeah. Um, yeah, you can be in this class, quote unquote, for the baraka. If, but if this doesn't really change anything in our lives, where is the baraka? Yeah. And what what does he reply? He's been thinking about this. He immediately says, I've got eight useful lessons. It's he's all he's always evaluating his companionship. He's been there 30 years <laughs> and he's evaluating his companionship. What have I learned? Yes, this is what I've learned. This, he's, he's constantly in a state of Mahasava. Yeah. Is always reflecting. Yeah. And he says, I've got eight useful way lessons by the way of knowledge. And what is the point? He says, and they're enough for me. Yeah, I've got enough knowledge. I need to just act on this all knowledge. Yeah. For I hope for my deliverance and salvation because of them, i.e., because of acting upon them. And so Shaqiq says, What are they? And he carries on. What are they? The first one is that people love whatever they love. Yeah. People love whatever they love. Yeah. And if you don't know exactly what you love, 
just look at what's there in your life. Look around your room. Yeah, just look around your room, look around your house. Yeah, look around your life and your daily activities, what you do. Look, look in your phone. Yeah, <laughs> look in your phone. Yeah, it'll tell you, it'll give you a good idea of what you love. It'll give you a good idea, a very good idea, or possibly a frightening idea of what you love. Yeah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al Mar'u Ma'aman Ahab. Though you are with the one who you love. Yeah. Fit dunya wal akhirah. Yeah. Whatever you love now, you'll be with it now. And that's where you will be. If it was for good, inshallah it is for good. If it wasn't, then that's what it is. Yeah. So he says, anything and everything that you love, it's going to leave you. The end of the day, it'll leave you. It'll leave you for dunya before akhirah. Akhirah, everyone flees from each other. But here as well, once you die, it's all gone. Yeah? So, and no one's going to come. No one's going to come with you. So, take what you can. Take what you can with you with regards to your provision for your journey into eternity, which is righteous deeds. Righteous deeds. Yeah? And do not be of those people who sin for the sake of those whom they love. Do not sin for the sake of those who you love. Because it is utter folly to do so. Because by sinning for the sake of those who you love, you're getting them into even more trouble, Yom al Qiyamah. No doubt you're getting yourself into trouble. You're also getting them into trouble. The people who you caught quote unquote profess to love you, you're getting them into even more trouble by sinning, by going along with what they want, which is contradictory to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires of us. Do not sin for the sake of those who you love. This is one of those things, again, um, the things which is prevalent in our community, the pressures, do not sin for the sake of those who you love. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Help your brother, yeah, the one who is oppressed and the one who is the oppressor. And the companions of the Allah, and whom they asked, like, how, like, yes, we understand coming to the aid of our brother who is oppressed, but how do we understand, how do we help the oppressor? The Prophet said, he, firstly, he said, he's your brother, yeah, so stop him from his oppression. That's helping him, yeah. So take good deeds as your companion, yeah? By, by refusing to sin for the sake of those who you love, you're actually, you, you are in reality loving them because you want good for them, let alone for yourself, you want good for them as well, yeah? So do not take to your grave anything but good deeds and know that everything else will leave you. Khair, inshallah ta'ala. Any questions? Any questions or comments? Nasreen, any questions or comments? No, thank you, Ustaz. Jazakallah Nafisa? No, sir. Jazakallah khair. Muhammad? Jazakallah khair. Jema, anything? No, Jazakallah khair. Okay, khair inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah, we'll finish that and carry on next week, inshallah ta'ala. اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وفقهنا إذا جهلنا ورزقنا علما نافعا وعملا متقبلا خالصا لوجهك الكريم وافتح علينا فتوح العارفين وعلحقنا بعبادك الصالحين وجعلنا من خدمة هذا الدين وجز الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم ما هو أهله وجزاكم الله كل خير والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته